tips for preventing a malpractice lawsuit on this week's medical economics. I think that there is somewhat of a misconception that it's a jackpot mentality that patients will sue because they think they can get a lot of money. But the fact of the matter is, especially in the medical negligence field, there's so many barriers to being able to bring a successful lawsuit that that really is not the primary driving force for people when they have to then overcome those barriers. A lot of times, patients just want to know what happened. And it's partly because the physician has not communicated what has happened, or why it's happened, or given a reasonable explanation that they feel they have to seek answers. The threat of a malpractice lawsuit is something every physician worries about, and for good reason. Studies have found that about half of all physicians will face a malpractice suit at some point in their career. But despite these statistics, doctors should not think a lawsuit is inevitable. In fact, malpractice experts say there are practical steps physicians can take to prevent lawsuits. It boils down to having open and honest communication with your patients and documenting these encounters clearly and comprehensively. Today, we sat down with malpractice attorney Fred Cummings to discuss ways physicians can proactively defend themselves against the threat of a lawsuit. How likely is a physician to face a lawsuit during their career? Well, statistics really vary, Chris. Um, I've seen statistics as many as a third to a little over half of physicians can reasonably anticipate facing a lawsuit sometime in their, in their medical career. And of those who have been sued, about half of those will get sued again. So obviously primary care physicians don't get sued as often as specialists. Specialists get sued more often. Can you talk about some of the top reasons that physicians are sued? Well, just generally, the largest reason why physicians are sued is because of either a failure to diagnose a condition or there was an unexpected complication from surgery, or even that you know, just any type of poor outcome may lead a, a physician to be sued uh, in, in general. For a primary care physician, a lot of times, uh, failing to refer a patient up to an appropriate specialist uh, is going to get them you know, in trouble quite a bit. Um, I often will lecture to physicians and say, the, primary reason physicians get sued though is poor documentation. So that's the uh, outcome is reason what motivates a patient to sue. Poor documentation is what motivates the attorney to bring that lawsuit. One of the things many physicians are concerned about is lawsuits resulting from errors with the EHR system. Um, can you talk a little bit about what some of the problems are with EHRs and some of the, the potential risks that they uh, involve? Well, EHRs themselves, electronic health, electronic health records themselves, do not cause a lawsuit. But the poor application of those, if that tool does, can cause a lawsuit. Uh, training is a big issue with uh, individuals for uh, electronic medical records and not knowing exactly how they work and what they're supposed to do. And then in the setup, Sometimes they're not set up as you might find in a traditional chart. For example, there is no section that indicates that the test that came in was reviewed. That's one other aspect of it. Another aspect of it is the repopulation of charts from prior visits, which is or, you know, the copy and paste method of electronic medical records. That's a huge problem, both in a primary care office as well as a hospital. I've seen electronic, electronic medical records take a hospital chart from 100 pages to 400 pages because of repopulation. The problem with that is that sometimes hospital day one is transferred as if it were in existence on hospital day five without any improvement, without any additional therapies. Just the last sentence is what the doctor did on post-op day five. That's a problem because we're going to assume that the records on that day reflect what the patient's care was. The other aspect of electronic medical records that do get physicians in trouble is that they tend to rely too much on the drop-down box method that you find a lot in EHRs. And they'll only record positive pertinence, that is positive findings during their exam, but do not spend enough time saying what is negative 
you know, what negative findings there are. In a lawsuit scenario, sometimes that's interpreted as you didn't check. And I know that every physician has heard if it's not documented, it didn't happen, right? That includes recording the negatives. And that's a, that's a big thing for emergency, uh, for electronic medical records. The other aspect, of course, are things that you would find in just any chart that is information that's not correctly taken down, incomplete medication lists, uh, not having your electronic medical records set up so that there are warnings if you prescribe one medication and then prescribe another medication that may be contraindicated. So a hospital, of course, has that system, but now I think that we're finding the trend is that physicians are supposed to also have that uh, in, in their bailiwick of their electronic medical records so that uh, they can uh, obviously provide for patient safety. It's all about patient safety. In your experience, what are patients really looking for when they sue for malpractice? You know, I think it's surprising. Physicians, I think, are surprised sometimes to find out that patients aren't solely motivated by money. I think that there is somewhat of a misconception that it's a jackpot mentality, that patients will sue because they think they can get a lot of money. But the fact of the matter is, especially in the medical negligence field, there's so many barriers to being able to bring a successful lawsuit that that really is not the primary driving force for people when they have to then overcome those barriers. A lot of times, patients just want to know what happened. And it's partly because the physician has not communicated what has happened, or why it's happened, or given a reasonable explanation that they feel they have to seek answers. Uh, an, another reason can be so, solely just so that whatever has happened to them doesn't happen to others. And then there are some more surprising motivations, including revenge, <laughs> uh, getting back at the physician. If they did this to me, I want to make sure they don't practice again, those type of things. Those type of patients are quickly disillusioned by the system because we generally do not take such actions in a civil lawsuit, of course. But a lot of times, patients just simply want to find out what happened. What are some communication techniques that physicians can use to uh, prevent the risk of a malpractice lawsuit? Communication is essential. I mean, and that is really the root of all relationships, isn't it? And no more so than a physician-patient relationship. And sometimes, of course, and especially in a primary care setting, but really in all settings, the pressure to document as well as listen to the patient is overwhelming and a lot of times patients complain about the fact that the doctor never looked at me. He was spending the whole time on his computer. He was saying, he was trying to input what I was saying, but he never looked at me, you know, and then he didn't really explain what he was doing. He didn't, I didn't feel like he listened to me. And I can tell you, especially in the primary care field, that if a patient feels like they've been listened to, that you heard their complaints, and that you then explained why they were feeling what they were feeling and what you were going to do about it, that you create a bond. It's almost like the partnership that a lot of times we talk about. We want to create a partnership with our, with our patients. That's how you do it, by communication, making them feel that they're part of their health care. You spoke earlier about how documentation is one of the most important things to prevent a lawsuit. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes that physicians make when it comes to documentation? Well, first of all, it's to document in and of itself. Do not abandon your tried and true, true principles of the SOAP format, subjective findings, objective findings, assessment, and plan. Do not abandon that because your electronic medical record doesn't seem to fit it quite as well. Uh, even in the comments section, then, you want to make sure that all of those things are there. Why? Because somebody down the line, a lawyer or other physician, needs to know what your thought process was. And sometimes just by putting down just this, the bare bones of what electronic medical records will do will create a false impression in the record. The other thing that physicians oftentimes don't do is pay attention to actually what they're doing in terms of what they're putting down. They're dic they don't check their dictation and then don't notice that words are missing, that sometimes they're very critical words. Or they rely too much, and this is very true for electronic medical records, on boilerplate things that they have already pre-populated the chart because they, this is a routine thing that they do all the time. Or 
or it's a condition that they treat all the time and they already have a boilerplate, this is what we do, it's like a cookie cutter. But the problem with that is, as we know, patients aren't necessarily the round peg that will fit into that square hole, right? And so that's where a lot of times physicians get in trouble by not uh, individualizing you know, the patient's chart. And then every other aspect of charting that you've heard uh, from before still exists today, which is charts are incomplete, medications are not all written down in the correct uh, amounts or, or what the patient presently is taking, uh, patient's medical histories aren't recorded. I mean, essentially, the patient chart is your documentation of your interaction with this patient and your understanding of the patient's health care. And if something's missing, then that's going to get exploited in a, in a later, later, later medical negligence suit. So if you're facing a lawsuit, what are some of the things that you should do right away to try to uh, mitigate your risk? Um, and also on this other token is what are some things you should not do? Well, certainly one thing you want to do is not ignore it. And I have had physicians that on day 23, three days after they're supposed to answer the complaint, call me and say, well, I got this complaint, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and so uh, what happens is not necessarily good for the physician. The first thing you want to do is not ignore the fact that you've been sued. The second thing you want to do is if you have medical negligence insurance, you want to contact your insurance care. That is a requirement of every medical policy, insurance policy that's out there. Um, the next thing you want to do is marshal your records and all of the records that relate to the patient, not just the ones that you think they may be complaining about the care that, that might be at issue, but all of your care because everyone is going to want all of your care for that patient something to keep in mind as you're charting is that it's not just any particular visit that may get focused on. It may be your, your continuity of care the, and whether that was present or not. So that's another thing. Um, here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to change the record. You don't want to modify the record. You don't want to add to the record. You want to keep the record as it is. Second thing you don't want to do is talk to everyone about the lawsuit and how you feel wronged by it and how the patient is wrong and you are right and what's wrong with the legal system today. Really what you want to do is just talk to your insurance care, talk to your lawyer and your spouse and that's it. <laughs> you don't want to talk. And the reason is because anything you say, sort of like we hear in crime shows, can and will be used against you. Uh, because that could cause people to go out and interview people that you've talked to and find out what your present state of mind was. Did you make any admissions that were perhaps against your, your interest or your defense? Uh, that's, that's what you want to avoid. One of the things we hear about often is that physicians practice defensive medicine to try to uh, prevent lawsuits. Um, what, like, one question I have is, uh, does defensive medicine actually work? Does it actually help prevent a lawsuit? Well, if by defensive medicine you mean ordering a test, a diagnostic test, or recommending medical treatment that um, may not necessarily be the best option, but it's an option that serves the physician in hoping that they don't get later sued for malpractice. And I would say studies are mixed on this, believe it or not. There are some studies which suggest defensive me uh, medicine works in this way, which is that the statistics that we really can keep on this is you've ordered all these tests and then how have you been, what's your, what's the practice been the following year? Uh, have you been sued or, or those cadre of physicians that they get sued a lot? And there is some evidence to suggest that defensive medicine in fact works. However, there are downsides to that. One, and let's just talk about things that aren't legal, is the medical ethics of it, right? Because if you know that you're ordering a test that might not be necessarily indicated, but you just want to make sure that you're protected, uh, that is not medically ethical to do. Second is you might not be solving the problem. And, and the reason for that is by ordering a test or a medical procedure that you have recommended for the patient, you are now subjecting the patient to an additional risk of harm that may then later come back to bite you. We can all see see that scenario happening where you've ordered a test that you think eh, might not be really necessary, but I need to you know, make sure I've got my butt covered. 
and then something happens untoward in the test. And now the motivation and uh, reason for the test is going to be at issue as well. And so let me tell you where that goes. Oh, the doctor's putting profits over patient care. And that is a deadly argument in a jury trial. So defensive, mechanism, me, defensive medicine, I certainly understand why it's practiced. And yes, sometimes it has been successful. But you're really increasing your risk of having a malpractice suit brought against you and one that may not be defensible. So in general, what are some tips for physicians to avoid a lawsuit? Well, one of the hallmarks of lectures I give to physicians is the importance of documentation and accurate documentation. Uh, as I mentioned before, poor documentation in a medical chart will be the number one reason why an attorney is going to be interested in taking the case because then they will be able to more easily prove as your medical chart is put up the size of a Volkswagen bus in front of a jury. So, and that's what you have to think of is, can I defend this chart the way it looks? As a side note, poor documentation is the number one reason why medical boards discipline physicians. And so you have two incentives to make sure that you properly document your chart. I can't also stress enough how important communication is with your patient. Um, it's human nature, isn't it, that if you feel some sort of bond or relationship with your patient and the patient feels that with you and they feel trusted, you know, they, they feel that they can trust you, well then that goes a long way to uh, patients basically accepting the consequences of their medical condition and medical care and can go a long way to avoiding an unnecessary and messy lawsuit.